Hi, I'm Wayne Besson, Executive Director for Truth Wins Out. As we navigate scary and uncertain times, it's important to look to history as a guide. During my quarantine in Philadelphia, I reread A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century. It's a book by Barbara Tuckman, and Chapter 5 discusses how people reacted during the ominous Black Plague. It offers lessons we can apply to today's COVID-19 pandemic. Ironically, the book actually cheered me up, because if you think about it, Things aren't as bleak as they were back then. Remember that the Black Plague wiped out nearly one in three people in Europe and the Middle East between 1347 and 1351. This translates into more than 20 million corpses, although no one knows for sure. At the time, it was widely thought that God had given up on humanity to punish them for their sins. Much of the population thought it might be the end of the world. So as bad as things are, and as frustrating as they may be, it's important to count our blessings and realize that things could be significantly worse today. In October of the year 1347, trading ships arrived from the Black Sea and pulled into the harbor of Messina, Sicily. The sailors on those doomed ships were sick and quickly dying with a horrific new disease. With its trademark black boils and rapid death, the illness quickly spread like wildfire across Europe. Of course, we are a much, much more advanced civilization today. But some things haven't changed, chiefly human nature, which means there are direct parallels between then and now that we can learn from, and it's important that we do. The first lesson, when people are frightened, they seek answers. Unfortunately, a significant subset also seek out scapegoats. In medieval Europe, Jews were falsely blamed for creating the Black Plague by poisoning the wells. In Swavois, in 1348, Jews were rounded up, put on trial, and tortured until they confessed to poisoning the wells with packets of poison pills that they allegedly kept in narrow stitched leather bags. These coerced confessions were distributed by letter from town to town, and they formed the basis for mass retribution. A brutal and deadly wave of false allegations and savage attacks quickly ensued. The first assaults occurred in the spring of 1348 in the French towns of Narbonne and Corsacon. Jews were dragged out of their homes and thrown into bonfires. On January 9, 1349 in Bale, Switzerland, the entire community of several hundred Jews were burned in a wooden house especially constructed for that purpose on an island in the Rhine River. As if this weren't bad enough, the town then passed a decree banning Jews for 200 years. In February 1349, rabid mobs forced the Jews of Strasbourg, France, numbering 2,000 to burial grounds, where everyone who didn't convert to Christianity on the spot was burned at rows of stakes that were set up. Barbara Tuckman wrote that in Freiburg, Augsburg, Nuremberg, Munich, Konigsberg, Regensburg, and other city centers, Jews were slaughtered by mobs with a thoroughness that seemed to seek a final solution. Sound familiar? At Worms, Germany in March 1349, the Jewish community of 400, like that of York, turned to an old tradition and burned themselves to death in their own homes rather than be killed by their enemies, which were at the doors. In Maine, 6,000 Jews fought back until they were overpowered by the horde and murdered in cold blood. Of the 3,000 Jews of Erfurt, none was reported to have survived. The last pogroms took place in Antwerp and in Brussels, where in December 1349, the entire Jewish community was exterminated. Today in 2020, there were no shortage of ignorant people and demagogues looking to point fingers, stir up trouble, assign blame, and inflame tensions. They are opportunistically attempting to exploit the COVID-19 crisis to provoke hatred against groups they dislike. Shamefully, this effort has been led in part by President Donald Trump. You keep calling this the Chinese virus. There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? Because it comes say from it's China. Racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. There were those also trying to blame LGBT people for the spread of the coronavirus. Obviously, this is ridiculous and irrational, but her opponents don't care. They're simply looking to foment hate and provoke a violent backlash. 
fake news reports that homophobes are deliberately spreading a conspiracy theory that gay people cause coronavirus by partying too much. They're using an old video from a Brazilian carnival and calling it Italy. Unfortunately, the fake video has gone viral, no pun intended. Metro Weekly reports that Pastor Perry Stone of Cleveland, Tennessee blamed the coronavirus on gay marriage. NBC News reports that the Reverend Ralph Drollinger, Trump's cabinet Bible teacher, said that LGBT people caused God's wrath in a blog post on COVID-19. This obnoxious behavior should surprise no one. We all remember that after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, LGBT people were conveniently targeted by well-known televangelists, including Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson. We make God mad. I, I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make that an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who tried to secularize America, I point the thing in their face and say, you helped this happen. Well, I, I totally concur. Clearly, the goal is to bully and blame LGBT people. They want the populace to turn on gay people and scapegoat them, causing mental anguish and possible physical harm. Thankfully, the LGBT movement in this country has advanced enough that most Americans aren't buying the evil lies that these hate preachers are selling. Had this finger pointing occurred only a couple decades earlier, however, it's likely the consequences would have been far greater. And in other countries where LGBT rights are less secure than they are here, the effects of such reckless rhetoric could still prove deadly. In fact, a Ukrainian LGBT organization pushed back against such bigotry by suing Orthodox patriarch Filaret over comments blaming the spread of the coronavirus on same-sex marriage. Common theme here? <laughs> The gay rights activist said that this backward comment from the bishop risks fueling hatred and discrimination. And most predictably, the Jews are still being scapegoated today. Rick Wiles, a Florida pastor and the founder of a far-right website, True News, said on March 26th that God is giving the Jews the coronavirus because they oppose his son, Jesus Christ. There is also a wild online conspiracy theory that 5G wireless technology is responsible for spreading COVID-19. As a result, people are burning down cell towers, whether it's the 14th century or the 21st century. Irrational human behavior is quite predictable. I could go on and on and on with different examples of conspiracy scapegoating, but the vile practice is so widespread, I risk redundancy, so we'll move along. The second lesson in Barbara Tuckman's book is that some religious fanatics will brazenly disobey social distancing rules with little regard for the people that they harm and kill. They are selfish and don't care about anybody but themselves. They wantonly infect people. And if those individuals get sick or die, they chalk it up to God's will. In 1349, a group of roaming Christian religious zealots called the Flagellants erupted in a sudden frenzy, Barbara Tuckman wrote in a distant mirror. Members of this cult would literally whip their own bodies in penance until they bled. They roamed in large bands that sped across Europe with the same fiery contagion as the plague. And on the way, they merrily slaughtered Jews at every stop. These extremists had very strict rules. They were forbidden to bathe or shave, change their clothes, sleep in beds, talk or have intercourse with women without the group master's permission. Unsurprisingly, similar to today's moralizing hypocrites, the flagellants were later charged with orgies in which whipping was combined with sex. According to Tuckman's book, Organized groups of 200 to 1,000 flagellants stripped to the waist, beat themselves with leather whips tipped with iron spikes until they bled. While they cried aloud to Christ and the Virgin for pity and called upon God to spare us, the watching townspeople sobbed and groaned in sympathy. These bands put on regular performances in towns, including large church squares. The inhabitants greeted them with reverence and ringing of church bells, lodged them in their houses, and brought children to be healed. They dipped clothes in blood, which they pressed against their eyes and preserved as relics. As you can well imagine, this caused an explosion of new cases of black plague, leading to even more sickness, death, and despair. This was done at a time when they actually did know about social distancing. 
Now, they didn't know the science behind the theory or about the bacteria that caused the plague because they didn't have an understanding of science. But they did know that it was spread from close human contact. So even in the 14th century, what the flagellants did was grossly reckless and irresponsible. Which brings us to the year 2020, where we have the same self-absorbed religious zealots who have apparently learned nothing from history. Mired in ignorance and superstition, they flout the law, flock to megachurches, and foolishly believe that God will protect them. Some of those arrogant and thoughtless people will get sick and they will die. They will also infect innocent people who don't share their beliefs. One pastor learned the hard way. This was Bishop Gerald Glenn of New Deliverance Evangelistic Church in Richmond, Virginia. Every time somebody talks about the virus, you ought to say, Jesus. I can't hear nobody here. When they talk Corona, you ought to say Kagod. 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 God is bigger than the virus. Well, proving that God has a sense of humor, the good pastor died from the coronavirus on Easter Sunday. A third similarity with the 14th century are efforts by unethical charlatans to promote quack cures. Some of these magic elixirs to treat the Black Plague included drawing out the infection by making the infected person bleed, purging it with laxatives or enemas, lancing the black boils, application of hot plasters, pills of powdered stag's horn, compounds of rare spices, and emeralds. There was also the bizarre belief that latrine attendants were immune to the Black Plague. So many people visited the public latrines on the theory that the odors were efficacious. Of course, this was at a time when people thought washing the scalp with a boy's urine cured ringworm, and gout was treated with goat dung mixed with rosemary and honey. Talk about the cure being worse than the curse. Today we have Jim Baker, who's also peddling cures in 2020. God gave us this product, yes. I believe. Yes. You're saying that silver solution would be effective. Well, let's say it hasn't been tested on this strain of the coronavirus, but it's been tested on other strains yeah. of the coronavirus and has been uh, able to eliminate it within 12 hours. The final similarity between then and now is the role social and financial inequality plays in spreading diseases. Barbara Tuckman writes about the Black Plague. The rich fled their country places with wells of cool water and vaults of rare wines. The urban poor died in their burrows, and only the stench of their bodies informed their neighbors of their death. That the poor were more heavily afflicted than the rich was clearly remarked at the time in the North and the South. A Scottish chronicler, John of Fordun, stated flatly that the pest attacked especially the meaner sort and common people, seldom the magnets. Sound familiar? Unfortunately, then and now, different incomes often lead to different health outcomes. I guess they didn't have universal health care back then either. Well, that's our history lesson for today. Thanks for tuning in. And please sign up. Please sign up for our YouTube page at YouTube slash Truth Wins Out. That's YouTube Truth Wins Out. And also forward our video to your friends and family members. And be kind enough to consider a tax-deductible contribution to Truth Wins Out at truthwinsout.org. <laughs> Times are tough. So we could all definitely use your help. We can't do our important work without you. Until we meet again, see you next time.